Welcome to IDEA to IPO. Hello, I'm Jennifer Stowell. IDEA to IPO has been holding tech startup events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 150,000 members among all of our meetup groups all around the world. We have organized, promoted, and produced over 2,609 events. By any standard, by any measure, we are the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the history of Silicon Valley, bar none. We organize venture capital panels, legal workshops, and more. These days, we are 100% online. We hold an event nearly every day of the week. Check out our website at idea2ipo.com. Our featured speaker today is Roger Royce, one of the top venture capital attorneys in Silicon Valley. And he is passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Royce. Roger, take it away. Okay, thanks very much, Jennifer. Uh, thanks for that introduction. My name is Roger Royce. I'm a partner with the law firm of Haynes and Boone in Palo Alto, heart of Silicon Valley. This is part two of a series. If you were with us uh, two weeks ago, uh, you would have uh, <clears throat> you would have been privy to part one: how to prepare your startup for venture capital investment. Uh, we talked about positioning your company, whether you're an appropriate candidate for venture capital, what you can do to make yourself attractive to venture capital, whether you even want it. Today, it's going to be a little drier. We're going to drill down uh, more on terms, more on the process itself, uh, <clears throat> more on actually preparing and getting closer to venture capital. Now, I want to mention a few things. Uh, this is being recorded, and I am going to use slides. Uh, every Each of you will get a link after this is done. You'll get an email with a link to the recording as well as a copy of the slides. Uh, so you don't have to chat me. You're going to be getting a link with all of this. You'll also be invited to join my newsletter list, uh, my newsletter, and um, also my YouTube channel. Uh, this recording will be uh, on the Idea to IPO website eventually, but it'll also be on the Roger Royce Law YouTube channel. A couple of things, I've opened up the chat to everybody so that everyone can chat with everybody else. Think of this as a live event. If uh, you've got something you want to say, go, use, go ahead and use the chat. I'm going to start by telling you how to get a hold of me so you don't have to ask. Uh, that's my email. That's my LinkedIn. We have a new uh, LinkedIn group that we opened up for startups. I call it Startup Solutions, where we're posting lot, tons of content, uh, including these events as well as other events uh, materials, networking. Um, so I invite you to please join my, my, my LinkedIn group, Startup Solutions. All right, uh, we're going to go for one hour. I'm going to speak for one hour. We started about five minutes late, so I'll go about five minutes longer. Uh, one hour of, uh, of my presentation with slides, and then we're going to open it up to questions. So save up your questions, type them into the Q&A box, not into the chat box, type them into the Q&A box, and I'll try to get through all of them at the end of the presentation. I'll do my best. I, you know, I didn't get through all of them last time. Uh, this time I'll try to do that. Before we get started, I'll start with a poll. I'd like to know who's in the audience, uh, how many of you are startup entrepreneurs, uh, how many of you are um, established companies? Uh, service providers like me, investors, people from academia. Uh, okay, with uh, most of the polling in, uh, almost everybody, 80% of you are startup entrepreneurs. Uh, we have a few others. We have, we have some investors here, that's good. And uh, you might meet them on chat. Um, okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and conclude the polling. And with that, we have about 80% entrepreneurs and uh, about 5% investors and then a scattering of, of everything else. All right. Now we uh, also do these events uh, around the world because they're on Zoom now. And I guess I would also like to know where people are tuning in from. Normally people come in 
from Silicon Valley. That's our biggest group. That's where I am. I'm, I'm in downtown Palo Alto, heart of Silicon Valley. Um, the Golden Gate Bridge is not in Palo Alto, in case you were wondering. That's a virtual background. That's in San Francisco, last time I checked. But I'm in downtown Palo Alto, heart of Silicon Valley, and most of our attendees are typically from here. Right now, it's about a third of our attendees are Silicon Valley, about 40% other parts of North America, 10% uh, Asia. Looks like we've got some from Western Europe who stayed up late or got up early, depending how you look at it. Thank you for that. Um, people from Africa, people from Latin and South America, people from Eastern Europe and Russia, and people from others. So um, let me just leave this open for a little bit. It looks like the winner is other North America. We get a lot more of that now that we've gone virtual because it's just so easy to log into these events. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling just in case you're curious, 30% Silicon Valley, 40% other North America, 11% Asia, um, and a scattering of, of other countries and other geographies. All right, well, thank you for that. Okay, now um, comes the part of the program where I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to turn to my slides. All right. So as I said, this is how to prepare your startup for venture capital part two. Uh, even now I'm a lawyer and uh, what I'm going to be talking about is you should be seeing a disclaimer on your screen, by the way, if you don't, uh, please chat me. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, I'm going to be talking about primarily uh, legal issues, but a lot of, but that doesn't mean this is legal advice. I'm also going to get into some business issues. So uh, just don't take this as legal advice. If you hire me, then it's legal advice, but otherwise not. All right. Last week, we talked a lot about uh, sources of funding. I'm going to skip, skim through the slides really quickly. Talked about initial sources. We talked about the fact that uh, right now, venture capital is at almost all time highs. Um, venture venture backed acquisitions, look how high they are. $150 billion a year last year. This year we've already raised, um, I think $31 billion this last month. So it's been a starting up to be a big year, a big year in 2021. So venture capital is hot. Now's a great time to be out looking for money. We talked about whether you should take venture capital. Are you the kind of company that should give up equity instead of some other type of uh, financing? We talked about venture economics, get inside the VC's head. What are they thinking when they invest in you? What kind of metrics do they wanna see? Uh, we talked about company VC fit, what it takes. Um, again, more about economics. What is the VC gonna to wanna to see in terms of metrics and economics? And then from your side, how should you pick a VC if you're in that enviable position that you can talk to more than one? And then we started to get into structuring for venture capital. What should your company look like? How should it be put together? Uh, what's important? Why should you be a C corporation? That's what VCs invest in. If you're not one already, you'll want to be one at closing. Uh, why that's important. This huge benefit so called qualified small business stock. We went through uh, for review for most of you. Um, some things around founders equity. How should you split up that pie? How much equity should you give to your co-founders? How much should you have? And how do you police the ownership of the equity? Talked about bringing on advisors. How do you compensate advisors? Vesting, what is vesting? Who should vest? How long should they vest? Uh, how, what do the VCs think about vesting? Uh, we talked about class S super voting stock. And then finally, I think we ended, we're just starting to talk about cap tables. Now I went through all that really quickly. If you're interested in hearing more about any of that, uh, I welcome you to go to my YouTube channel uh, or go to SlideShare, find the slides, go to my YouTube channel, uh, Roger Royce Law, and you can see the whole hour of presentation, a deeper dive on all of those topics. So now we're going to kind of move on to the next stage here. I want to talk a little bit about the cap table. What is a cap table? Capitalization table is that ledger or that record or that summary rather, summary of a ledger of all of the ownership, the equity ownership and equitable interests in your startup company. Uh, on that cap table, you'll have common stock. I'm gonna get into an example in a minute here, but let me kind of define some terms first. Common stock is the residual, the residuary. It's what's left over after the preferred stock. It's what you, the founders get, what is given to founders for sweat equity. 
you don't sell common stock to raise money, right? You use common stock uh, to compensate, uh, or not compensate, but to uh, provide to founders and other service providers. Options, an option is a right to buy common stock usually. You can have an option on anything, but in the sense that I'm using it, an option is a right to buy common stock in a company. Uh, we'll talk more about this. Options have to be priced at fair market value. What does that mean? That means when someone is granted this right to buy stock in a company, it has to be at the value of stock as of the date of the grant. That is a tax rule and it is hard and fast. If you violate that rule, uh, you create big tax problems, tax penalties, both for the company and especially for the option E. Options are given to employees and consultants typically, and they are there to reward service providers. Uh, what if you wanna give an equity interest, something other than stock to someone who's not a service provider? Maybe it's your landlord, maybe it's a, an investor, your banker. Uh, I've seen warrants given to babysitters uh, in, in this valley. That is a warrant. The warrant similarly is a right to purchase stock in a company. And like an option, a warrant can be on common stock, it can be on preferred, it is typically on preferred. Oftentimes you see common stock warrants, those are what we call troubled company terms. Um, why is that, do you suppose? So the difference, I'm gonna tell you in a minute, but the difference between an option and a warrant is that typically, you know, generally, uh, options are rights for service providers. That's like employees to buy into the company. And if remember what I said, they have a right to buy in at today's fair market value. What does that mean? That means they're riding up the increase in value after they join. That's how you incentivize them to create value for the company. And typically options are, they're not exercised very often. I'm not saying never, I mean, more and more now um, as uh, companies get mature and, and people leave and they wanna hold on to their equity, um, they're exercising options. But uh, for the most part, people wanna hang on to them until there's a sale of the company and they can just cash out. They can just take the cash value of that option on sale or they can exercise immediately before the sale. Sometimes there's reasons you'd want to do that. But keep in mind, the idea is it's, it's a way for a service provider to get that increase in value of the company without having to invest in the company, without having to put any cash into it. It's a great deal, right? It's a great deal. Let me just say a couple of things before I turn to warrants on this. I don't wanna make this all about options, but it's good for you to know how this works. Silicon Valley was built on equity compensation and options are the cornerstone of equity compensation. You're an employee, you wanna have some equitable interest in your company, you wanna have an ownership interest, but you don't wanna to have to write them a check because you believe in them, your employer, but you don't believe in your employer quite that much. And in a place where probably 90% of companies fail, uh, that's wise to not believe in them that much. So an option means you don't have to come out of pocket. You don't have to come out of risk. You just ride the increase in value out. The downside is when you do get taxed, when you do exit, when there is a sale of that company and you cash that option out and you get your consideration, hopefully it's in cash, maybe it's in deferred payments, whatever it is, you're gonna be taxed at ordinary rates. Uh, they go all the way up to 37% right now. Joe Biden said last week he wants to push that up to 39.6. That's the top rate. It's not the blended rate or the average rate. It's the top rate, but hopefully it'll be such a big exit you'll be in that top uh, tax bracket. Uh, if that were stock instead, uh, you'd be taxed at a capital gains rate of 20% plus uh, net investment income tax of 3.8% plus state taxes. It's a lot less, right? It's almost 20% less. So that's the difference between option and stock. Difference between option and warrant options are for service providers. Warrant is similarly a right to buy stock, but you grant that to a non-service provider. Now, why do we have this big distinction? Um, I'll tell you why. Uh, an option is granted pursuant to a very particular kind of plan, a stock plan or a stock option plan. That plan qualifies for a securities law exemption because it's designed to reward service providers, individual type service providers. Uh, because of that, there's restrictions all over it, plus you want to restrict your service providers. In particular, you want them to be forced to either exercise that option or lose it a short time after leaving the company, right? It's to incentivize people to stay. So they have a short period of time, either 30 or 90 days, usually, to exercise their option after they leave the company or they lose it. Most people will just leave and not exercise. I'll just tell you that's as counterintuitive as that is, they'll leave and not exercise. If they'd gotten stock instead, they would leave and keep their ownership interest. 
A warrant doesn't have that restriction. A warrant is gonna have a term and that term is however long you decide. Could be three years, could be five years, could be 10 years, depends on the warrant. So we don't have the same, so we, we, we're not subject to all the restrictions that would typically apply to service providers because warrants are not given to service providers. Uh, and that's probably the biggest one. The other thing about warrants is they don't have to be granted at fair market value. You can have penny warrants. That means it's a penny a share. It's almost nothing. It's almost free. So the landlord or investor or lender or whoever it is that's getting the warrant, they're getting the same deal as an option E. They don't have to invest any money and they're riding the value of it. So that's the nature of a warrant. Typically, the warrant is on preferred stock to be issued in the next round, and it's at the preferred stock price. So really what they're going to ride up is the increase in value after the next preferred stock round. That's how it typically works. And again, a warrant holder will just sit and wait until there's a sale and then cash out. Do they get capital gains treatment when they cash out? I have an article on that in my blog post. Uh, Typically, no, because most warrants are not drafted very well. Uh, under my warrants, the answer is yes, because they are drafted by a tax lawyer. Uh, but that's a whole other hour, and I'm not going to get into that here. Convertible instruments, uh, that's convertible notes and safes. A convertible, uh, a convertible note is the idea that the investor comes along and they say, gee, Mr. Company, um, I want to invest in your company, but I don't know what you're worth. You're too early. I can't tell. The company says, I want to take your money, but I don't know what I'm worth either. So I'll tell you what, you invest, you know, you loan me the money today and we'll convert your loan into stock when we do a financing with that big VC that's going to value my company. You know how tough VCs are. It's going to be a pretty fair evaluation. In fact, we're going to give you a discount to the price the VC pays. So um, your price is going to be 80% of what the VC pays. So if the VC pays a dollar a share, you're going to get it for 80 cents a share. That's a discount, convertible note with a discount. Not only that, typically, these convertible notes say that if the, the, that you're going to get in at no higher than a certain valuation. So if the company, we think it's worth a million dollars today, but might be worth $50 million by the time you get around to getting an you know, investment, you know, we'll put a cap on that. So you get in at a lower valuation. Lower valuation, right, means higher percentage that your convertible note holder owns. That's a price cap, a valuation cap. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. That's a convertible note. A safe is convertible equity. The difference is, just like a convertible note, but does not bear interest, does not have to be paid back, you know, and doesn't have this short term on it, like notes typically have to have because of lending laws usually. So that's a safe. I'm going to talk a lot more about that in a minute. And then finally, on your cap table is preferred stock. That's what you're going to be selling the investor, right? Preferred stock. This differs from common stock in that it has preferences. It gets paid before the common stock unless it converts. We're going to take a deep dive in this in a minute. But just understand that it's different because it stands ahead of the common. When a company gets sold, or what we call a liquidation event, the preferred gets sold, gets paid first. Then the common gets the residuary. Because of that, the preferred stock is worth a lot more than the common. It's priced a lot more. Back in the good old days, it used to be 10 times as much as the common. That was a rule of thumb. Uh, now we have to get a professional valuation, but you can still expect to see preferred stock price five times. What the common is kind of depends on the terms of the preferred, but it's going to be worth a lot more than the common. That's important because you want your common stock price to be really low so that the option price is really low, so that the options are really attractive to your service providers. And people kind of, this is Silicon Valley, that's Hollywood with a wink and a nudge. They look at your common stock 409A value, they look at your preferred stock price, and they say, well, we know what that stock's really worth. Because you know, you know, if this company's ever going to do anything, it's going to have to be worth the preferred, you know, the preferred price, because the preferred is going to want to convert to common. So we think it's worth that. Um, but we know it's actually, according to the valuation people for tax purposes, worth the common stock price. What a great deal. All right, that's a lot of time on one slide. That might be a new record for time spent on a slide. I want to talk about safes uh, a little bit more before we get into that. That's what's going to be on your cap table. Let's pause on safes. And I'm pausing more and more because safe is a simple agreement for future equity, and they are becoming less simple all the time. Um, it started out as a great idea, and they used to be super simple. Um, and again, remember what I, I told you about discounts, I told you about valuation caps, and another feature that somebody thought of, well, gee, what happens if you sell the company? Um, 
what happens if you sell the company before you ever do a financing? Then what happens? Do I get how do I get back? So the investors will usually be allowed to either convert their safe to common stock and participate in the sale, or they're allowed to just get a multiple on the sale. Uh, the real nightmare scenario for the investors, the company just never, ever, ever does anything. You know, it just doesn't do a financing or a sale. It's not a note, doesn't have a repayment term, it might never get repaid. Um, so I'm going to circle back to SACE, but now that we know what these interests are, here's a pretty typical cap table. Actually, probably not typical, but, you know, it's where I like to start. Um, we started off with, um, uh, we backed into this cap table. So this is where... You know, when I set up a cap table, I say, gee, Mr. Fowler, let's do a little strategizing. Let's back into where you'd like to end up by the time you have enough money to do a liquidity event. Sharpen up our pens, get the Excel, Excel jockeys out there working on this. And let's say this is what you want your cap table to look like when you sell. Um, you're going to lose control by the time you get through Series B. You might as well just, you know, get used to that. So look at there, you got 38% on a fully diluted basis. 45% on an issued basis. What do I mean by that fully diluted? So <clears throat> fully diluted means you take into account all convertibles and options. That means that any warrants out there, you assume that somebody exercised them and you own the stock. That means any stock options that have been granted, you assume that the person exercised the option and owns the stock. That's fully diluted. That's how companies are ten tend to be valued. That's how stock tends to be priced. So fully diluted, yeah, you only have 38%, that's 5 million out of 13 million. But actually on a voting basis, um, you've got 45% because of the 2 million in the stock pool, that didn't get issued, uh, right? That's just sitting there on issue. We should just call that uh, unexercised options actually. So let's say you've got 45% of the issue that's still not 50. So you lost control of this company. You should expect to be there, but you didn't lose a lot of control and you've raised two rounds of funding and this is where you want to exit. That's kind of what I aim for a lot of times. Well, how do we get there? Well, we're gonna start with our, remember we had 4 million for the founders in my last example, then we set aside a stock pool, uh, then we uh, will set us, we'll set aside another 20 to 40% for series A, then another 20 to 40 for series B. I'm not gonna go through the math with you. I think you get the idea. What I do wanna go through with you is something more important than that. And that's how these safes can affect what you're doing. Now there's really two kinds of safes. There's a, there's a pre-money, well, there are a lot of kinds of safes, but you oftentimes see pre-money safes and post-money safes. Uh, what, what does that mean? Um, the pre-money safes means that we're valuing the company that safe is gonna convert based on, remember that valuation cap I told you about in case the value of the company goes way up? The pre-money safe is gonna convert based on the valuation of the company prior to taking into account the, the safe and everything else. So if you sell a million dollar safe to somebody with a pre-money valuation cap of 4 million, that means the safe is gonna get 20%, right? $1 million safe over, well, it's pre-money 4 million plus you got my million dollars from the safe, that's 5 million post. So that's 20%. If this were a post-money safe, the safe would take 25%. They would say that after the financing, the company's worth 4 million, one over 4 million is 25. Guess which one's better for the company, all right? So pre-money. In my mind, it's really kind of the only thing that makes sense because you don't know where you're gonna be post-money. You know where the safe will be, they'll be at 25%, but that could be 25% of $5 million or 25% of $500 million. You don't know, because you don't know how much other money you're bringing in. Doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. That's why I call post-money safes unsafes. All right, um, they're very unsafe. You could give away a lot of your company that you probably should not have done so. Uh, the difference is the pre-money safe are gonna get diluted by other safes you know, at a high level. There's other differences. Post-money safes are not gonna dilute uh, for other safes. Um, this, is, this is the big thing. And you really need to understand what you're getting in for. If you have gone online and you downloaded a form that you found on the internet and you just had your investors sign that, Number one, you got big securities law problems. We'll talk about that maybe last week or maybe next week. Uh, but you might want to, might want to take, a chat, take a look and see what it is you exactly gave away. Uh, if it's a post-money basis, better be careful. There's a really cool tool I found called Safe Genie IO that allows you to go ahead and um, uh, run some numbers and do some projections and figure out uh, you know, where you should end up. Uh, if you've got a 
you know, a pre-money safe. You see the big objection to pre-money safes is, well, the investor doesn't know what percent they have. You know, they don't know what percent because you don't know how many other safes are going to come into the company. And the more new money comes in, the more they get diluted, right? Right? One million of five million is different than one million of, of 10 million. Okay, I, I get that, you know, but, you know, welcome to the world of math. I mean, that's how VCs invest. Of course, you don't know what percent you're going to have because you don't know how big that pie is going to be. You don't know how much money is coming in. But if that really does bother you, use the safe genie and you can run some what ifs and some projections. All right, that's your cap table. We just spent a lot of time on it, but it's important that you go to the VC with a cap table that makes sense. You go there with a cap table that might have one or might have all of those things on it that I just showed you, but for sure, you want there to be enough stock in a deal for your founders. And a safe is the one thing that might mess you up. I've seen that happen. You know, People sold way more of their company than they thought they did. Um, Remember Bugsy Siegel, who sold, uh, what was it, the Sant no, the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas two or three times over? I haven't seen anybody do that. I saw one founder sell his company 125% of the time, but that's just because he was bad at math, uh, not because he was trying. Um, a safe, you run into a similar problem. You're giving up more percentages than you think. And where's that coming out of? It's not coming out of the investor's hide, coming out of the founder's hide. Why does that bother the investor? The reason that bothers the investors is because they need to know there's enough equity in there to incentivize the founder to get to those post V numbers that I showed you, because they need the founder to be incentive. And if you do a C round, it gets even lower. And a D round, and you go through the alphabet, you need to keep the founders incentivized. You need to have enough common stock to do that. If you give away too much of your equity uh, in these safes and convertibles, you won't be there. So that's issue number one, okay, job one. Here are some other issues I'd like you to think about before we get into, um, before we get into actual terms. Uh, intellectual property, big issue. Uh, watch my video and my presentation, top 10 legal mistakes that startups make. This is in my top 10 uh, IP rights. Make sure you secured the rights to the, your intellectual property. I wanna remind people, if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. Um, we are going to share the recording and the slides by email at the end of this presentation within the next few days, uh, probably tomorrow, uh, but gather up your questions for me. We're going to take them at the end of the hour, at the end of the hour and five, I guess. So IP rights, get invention assignments. This is the one thing that people miss the most. An invention assignment means that anybody that works for your company uh, or does anything that touches your IP or your intellectual property or your trade secret, They've assigned their rights. They've, um, you know, they've uh, they've signed a document that makes sure that the company has ownership. Make sure that you get these invention assignments. Why is that important? The reason that's important is because when your investor comes along, the number one thing, if you're a tech company, like I represent tech startups and some venture capitalists, but mostly tech startups, your investor is going to want you to promise them that you own your intellectual property. You cannot make that promise uh, unless you've got all these assignments from people who have worked on it. Because if you don't, they might have an argument that they've got at least a revocable license. That means a right to use your IP. And if they've got a right to use it, you don't have a right to stop them. If you don't have a right to stop them, you don't have what in the law is known as ownership. So uh, these things are very important. Um, employment claims, this gets bigger and bigger and bigger all the time. And I'm seeing companies go down in flames over employment claims. I used to tell the story of HomeJoy almost every time I got a chance to talk. That's a company that threw a class action employment misclassification place. It was a gig economy business. It was a platform for housekeepers. Uh, they, uh, they lost $40 million of venture capital, couldn't do a follow on round. Uh, we've got a more recent example, go Google Handy. That's the latest company uh, to come under fire. This by the cities of San Francisco and Los Angeles for misclassification. Uh, these are the kind of claims that are extremely expensive. Uh, they're distracting, they're time consuming. They make lawyers rich and they make investors unhappy. Uh, it's gonna be hard to get a VC to invest in a company that has an employment claim. Tax claims, uh, very closely related to employment claims. If you have an employment claim, you've got a payroll tax claim just right along with it. There's all kinds of other taxes that might apply. Most of my clients don't worry too much about taxes. They don't make any money. If they're making money, they're doing something wrong. They wanna reinvest all those earnings and build a big asset to sell at a capital gain. However, you'd be surprised how many times we've got through financing, we run a lien search and there are tax claims sitting out there. Get rid of those. 
um, uh, that's going to be an issue that will come up. By the way, all of this stuff, why am I telling you this? The VC is going to tell you this. If I don't, you don't want them telling you about these problems. They're free if you find them. You can find them. You can fix them, right? If you find them, you can go out to the employees and twist their arm and get them to sign us a confidential information agreement and invention assignment. Uh, if the VC finds it, they might walk. They might beat you up on valuation. They might drag out the deal. You want to find this stuff. Litigation, claims by prior employer. We talked all about that in my top 10 legal mistakes. Just make sure that you haven't taken your IP from somebody else. Uh, vesting restrictions. You should have had vesting in place by now or you, if you were with us two weeks ago. If you're not, you better have a very cooperative group of founders who's willing to put vesting in place so that they're incentivized to stick around. A venture capitalist wants to know that you're going to be there. And it's always worthwhile taking a look at your material agreements uh, and making sure that they are solid. By the way, here's a diligence issue for you in those material agreements. Um, don't give away the farm. You know, don't give away the farm. I see that sometimes people, you're, you're a small startup. You, you finally secured that big contract with big industrial. They send you their standard agreement. It's very egregious and one-sided as you might expect. And inside it, there's an invention assignment. Turns out she gave away uh, your IP and you're no longer fundable. Don't, don't think that doesn't happen. I've seen it. All right, I want to talk about stage financings. So here's the thing. Interestingly, I got a call from a reporter today um, who said, uh, hey, what do you think about these SPACs for startups? You know what a SPAC is? Special Purpose Acquisition Company. It's a way to go public these days. We had about $80 billion, $83 billion last year in SPAC deals. Uh, that was about 40% of the IPO market. This year, we've already had eight, depending who, 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 you, who you believe, around $80 billion, already around $80 billion of SPAC deals, um, it's a way to go public, right? And without and that's 76% of the IPO market, special purpose acquisition vehicle. That's where somebody takes a shell, they take it public, uh, they raise money through the public markets, the public offering, and then the shell takes that cash and go buy and buys a company. I've had a couple of startups come to me and say, hey, I've had SPACs that are after me. They're quite persistent. Uh, they say that they can acquire me, they can give me stock in the deal, I can end up in you know, my little company, instead of spending the next five years grubbing for money from venture capitalists, you know, I can be in the SPAC, I can have some stock, the SPAC will have some dry powder, it'll keep some cash, we don't have to go get financing anymore. And I say, well, let's think about that. That is about as contrary to the startup strategy as you can get, because right now your company is not worth a lot of money, right? If you're if you're here, if you're listening how to get venture money, it's probably not worth what it could be, right? It's not worth what it could be. You're betting it's going to be worth a whole lot more down the road, so it's probably not the deal for you. If you're not a now, if you're not a venture capital candidate, if you're a private equity candidate, then ah yeah, go check it out. You know that SPAC might be the 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 life for you but typically not for the kinds of companies I deal with. Instead, what you want to do is you want to raise a little bit of money at your low valuation, right? You're going to raise your, your venture, your first venture round at your $10 million valuation. And then your next round at your $50 million valuation. Then your next round at your $150 million valuation. What would happen if you took all that money in today at your $10 million valuation? There'd be nothing left for you. Right, that staged value, that staged financing. You only take as much money as you need, and you take it enough to get you to the next valuation event. Um, rules of thumb: uh, I'd like that to last one or two years, uh, and I'd like that next valuation event, whatever it is. This gets us to, I don't know, to 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 get into the market, uh, hopefully or beyond launch, uh, whatever that valuation metric is, to get FDA approval whatever it is, and I'd like that next bump to be 2x. That's what we're aiming for, one to two years and a 2x bump. Now, it's important that you don't take money at too high a valuation early on. Sounds odd to say, doesn't it? And it's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, if you have to do a round at this value now, and then the next round is at a lower valuation, they call that a down round. Um, that's a really bad thing. Um, it's a bad thing because it signals the market you didn't hit your numbers, you didn't do as well as you thought, but also uh, there's going to be some dilution in there for you. Uh, we'll talk about anti-dilution protection. And if we go through the math, I can show you mathematically 
that you are worse off as a founder in terms of your ownership by taking money at a high valuation and doing a series of down rounds than if you just took money at the lower valuation and stayed flat or up rounds. Um, so avoid down rounds, you know, don't get too aggressive. You wanna have progressively increasing up rounds. Pitch deck, uh, I know people do hours and hours on pitch decks. I'm not going to do that. I'm a lawyer, not a pitch deck guy, <laughs> but I have seen a lot of them. Uh, I'm also an angel investor, so I have a discriminating eye as well. Um, and I will tell you that there are just a handful of things you want in your pitch deck. Uh, you want your market size, you want your team, uh, your product, uh, your go-to-market strategy, something about your financials, although we all know you're, you're, you're making those numbers up because you're too early to have good financials. Don't talk about valuation. Um, I don't spend a lot of time with pitch decks. Uh, I, let, I let the experts do that. Instead, though, I do spend some time with executive summaries. This is like your pitch deck boiled down into one or two documents, right? Your pitch deck's going to take maybe an hour to get through. Hopefully, you can do it in 10 minutes, but you can go through maybe an hour uh, if people sit there and ask you questions in a meeting. Your executive summary, on the other hand, um, that's got to be one or two pages, just the facts, right? And just the things I said. And this is a good template that I use. I give this to my startup companies, and I say, hey, fill this out, and we'll find out in a hurry who is interested in you and who is not. Now, um, the um, first thing is the team, right? You wanna really, if your team is strong, highlight your team. Um, what is that saying? You don't bet on the horse, you bet on the jockey. So make sure you, you highlight your jockey. Um, by the way, uh, I just finished reading a book last week. The name of the book is Backable. Um, and it, it actually talks about some of my venture clients uh, and some of the criteria they've applied. Uh, the book itself is sort of a disorganized, disorganized mishmash of disconnected stories, but he does make some good points. And one of the stories he tells is about one VC that um, I don't want to give any names or, or away, but a pretty well-known consumer products VC that I've worked with for 25 years now, um, who uh, got a pitch deck and got a summary from a consumer products company that was a little out there. It's kind of hard to understand that this is a product people really want it. And she turned it down and she said, no, I'll pass. Then she met the guy uh, at some like party or mixer or social or something. And uh, he gave her the kind of capsulized version, the ex executive summary version, a little more than an elevator pitch. And uh, she was so impressed with the guy that she invested in it. That company exited at more than a billion dollars, more than a billion dollars. It was a huge exit, a huge win for the VC, huge win for the company, right? Um, so I guess the moral of that story is number one, how important team is, but how important it is to get that first meeting uh, and how important it is to make sure that you can convey the, the value. Uh, I'm hoping we can do that in executive summary. Um, what, what's that phrase, too long, didn't read, uh, TLDR? Uh, you don't wanna have a TLDR. Uh, projections, if you got them, we all know that uh, you're making them up, but you got to try uh, something about the market, something about the industry. They might not even exist. If not, you're going to have to paint that picture. And boy, if you've got IP, this is the place to stretch it. IP is the ability and the right to keep, keep people out of the market. Very, very important in tech startups. And by the way, I use IP broadly. What is your secret sauce? Uh, what is the thing? that makes you different than everybody else? What is it that keeps you away from your competitors? Okay, sorry, I know you don't have competitors. What is it that makes you better than your alternatives? Let me put it that way. All right, I say that broadly as IP. For some companies, it's patents and legal protection. Other companies, it's their trade secret. Valuation, remember what I said two slides ago, don't talk about valuation. Um, this VC is going to tell you what they think you're worth, right? Now, every once in a while, uh, they'll ask you for that number, but typically not. Typically, they're going to tell you, and they're going to tell you in a very formal manner by giving you a term sheet, okay? We're going to talk about term sheets now. The number one thing you're going to find in that term sheet is valuation. All right, here's an important point. You're not going to believe me, but valuation is not your biggest issue. Valuation might not be the most important thing in that term sheet. In fact, I'll tell you, it's not the most important thing. I think the identity of the VC is the most important thing. You want somebody who's got a reputation of, of picking winners and being able to do follow on rounds 
and being able to get you to the next round of investors. But valuation is important and we have to pay attention to it. So that's going to be in a term sheet. And it'll basically say, you're worth X dollars. Your valuation is $8 million pre-money. We're going to give you $2 million. Uh, and that means you're worth $10 million post-money. We just went through all that. That'll be in the term sheet. I'm going to come back to transfer restrictions. If perchance the venture capitalist is unwilling to put a price on you, it's negotiation 101. They want you to come out, come out of swinging uh, and give them a number first. Uh, yeah, aim high, of course, but you got to back up your number. Uh, if anybody emails me, I actually have a memo uh, with about 30 different ways that I've seen investors value companies over the years. It's one for every year I've been doing this. Um, but you want to come up with three methods that converge, and then you can go tell your story. And who knows, maybe you'll, maybe they'll buy it. I'm not going to go through all of these. Suffice it to know they're there. Okay. After you get over the shock of the valuation, what's the next thing you should notice? Um, they're going to ask for a preferred stock. That's what VCs invest in. And there's going to be a participation right or a non-participation. Now, what does participating mean? Participating preferred stock means that the preferred stock shares in the upside. In other words, if it's participating, if the investor puts in a million dollars at a four million pre, so they've got 20% post, that means they get on sale, they get their $1 million plus 20% of everything uh, beyond that. They share with the commons. So they get their money back and then they get their pro rata share. That's participation. Um, that used to be a lot more common than it is now, especially in this environment, because there is a tremendous amount of money out there in this environment right now. So now what we typically see is non-participating convertible preferred. Let's break that down. Non-participating means it does not share, it just gets its money back. Unless it converts into common stock, then it gets its pro rata share. So you bought 20%, you bought uh, 1 million uh, on 4 million pre, 5 million post, that's 20% of the ownership. So you either get your million dollars back or you get 20%. Think about it, when would you take your million dollars? Well, if you have a sale at less than 5 million, right? Because that's gonna be more than 20%. When would you take your 20% when you have a sale at more than 5 million because the VC will get more than um, their million dollars if they take 20%. So they get to wait and see. That's non-participating convertible preferred. If there is participation, and um, like I say, we used to see this all the time. Uh, now I see it a lot less, but if there is, it's almost always going to be capped, okay? So it's like, okay, Mr. VC, you get your, you get your, uh, your, your, your preference. That's the preference, by the way. The preference is getting the money back. That's, the, that's why they call it preferred. They get their money back for, we have a preference. You prefer us. Okay, Mr. VC, you get your preference and you get participation, um, but we got to cap that, you know, at some point. And that's the, so you're, you're limited in the downside because you get your money back first. If we only sell the company for a million, you take everything. So we're going to cap the upside and it's usually at a multiple two, three, I've seen five times. I don't think I've seen it higher than that. Um, so if there is participation, it better be capped. And then there's this idea of conversion to common. Um, so it'll uh, auto convert when you do an IPO, a, a public offering, um, it'll convert to common. And also it converts on majority vote. Now, why would any VC agree to that? Why would we want to just agree that some other, someone, if we're gonna have like four VCs in this deal, and they can gang up on me and they can force me to take common. I'm not, not want common, I wanna keep my preferred. I negotiated so hard with them, had to deal with that Royce, you know, to sit across the table and listen to that obnoxious lawyer. And now you're gonna make me give up all those hard fought rights. Well, the reason is because there's really good reasons that you might want to do what we call a recap and convert everybody to common. If you've got a troubled company and you need to recap the company, push everybody, push the old investors back down into common so you can go out and incentivize new investors to get preferred, uh, you're gonna want a majority to be able to do that. You don't want any one investor to be able to hold you up and hold you hostage. Preferred will have a dividend preference. It is likely, um, uh, what, what, what's the word? Uh, it's, it, it, it's a dividend preference, but it's not meaningful. It is meaningless. That's the word, meaningless. Uh, why is it? Because typically in VC deals, dividends, in other words, a dividend preference mean the preferred stock gets their dividend before the common does. 
And not only that, they give a certain percent. You got to pay me a six or eight percent dividend, that six or eight percent of my money, uh, before you can pay anything to the common. It's meaningless because those dividends are always when, as, and if declared by the company. I'm not saying I don't have clients that declare dividends. I have some of them that just can't help themselves. They're profitable. As much as we try to reinvest and not be profitable and not pay taxes, but they can't help it. They got it and they dividend it out. But startup land, it's actually pretty rare. Uh, in preferred equity land, uh, you know, you do see cumulative dividends because those investments are a little more debt-like. Uh, but in startup land are typically non-cumulative. The dividend only, it goes away. If you don't pay it that year, it goes away and it only gets paid if it's actually declared, I wouldn't spend a lot of time worrying about dividends. Just make sure it's you know it's non it's non cumulative, and um, payable only when as and if declared. The liquidation preference we just talked about. I should probably put that slide first. That's who gets paid first. The VC does. They get their money back first, unless they convert to common. Um, given the time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We've already I've already given you this example. Take a look at the slides later if you want to go through the math, but there comes a point where it makes more sense to take your percent than it does to take your liquidation preference of the amount that you invested. Board representation. Um, the VC is going to want a seat on the board. Here's kind of some generalizations. Typically, Series A, your first institutional venture capital round, you should end up with a three-member board. You, the founder, should have one seat. The, v the lead VC is going to have one seat. And the third person will either be selected by the common or more likely some industry luminary uh, that's an independent. They call them an independent. Is it really independent? I don't know. There are courts that say it's pretty darn tough to be independent. Maybe we'll get to that later. But um, it's somebody that is not hopefully under the founder's thumb or the VC's thumb for that matter. And that's what you typically see. What does that mean? That means if you've got a three-member board now, and if you're a California corporation, you probably do, you're uh, going, someone's going to have to come off that board, right? And the VC is going to have to come on. So, you know, pick your founders wisely, your co-founders. Uh, there are founder-friendly boards. Um, uh, if you have uh, somebody who actually is under the thumb of the founder, but, um, and, and by the way, this, there's a lot of subtleties to this. There are a lot of big, well-known companies uh, that you look back on and you say, wow, that was a founder-friendly board. I'm not going to mention any of them, Theranos, but if you go Google it, you'll find Uber, a few of them that you'll know what I'm talking about. What is the role of the board? Uh, the board manages the day-to-day -day activities of the business, right? The board is actually responsible for running the business. The board actually selects the officers that control the day-to-day -day rule. They have fiduciary duties, duties of loyalty, duties of care, right? Um, um, duties of candor. So uh, a, a board uh, is a very important organization with awesome responsibilities. Because of those awesome responsibilities, what did, what did Spider-Man, the great philosopher Spider-Man once say, with awesome power comes awesome responsibility, uh, which comes off uh, uh, awesome uh, liability, so you better get DNO insurance. I think Spider-Man said that. So yeah, board members get sued all the time for mistakes. And you, first of all, you get indemnified by the company, but if your company has gone under, that doesn't help. So you back that up with DNO insurance. And uh, I'm a big believer in DNO insurance. Uh, and I've had this argument with lawyers all the time. And I think we're not gonna waste money on DNO insurance for this company, it's so low risk. Oh, you don't know, you don't know, you don't know until you read it in a complaint. So don't ever serve on a board without insurance. Observers are not board members. They have no authority. They sit in the meetings. They can comment. They can observe. Usually a VC wants to have more than one representative in the room when it happens. So um, they'll go ahead and appoint an observer. You can't vote. But sometimes these observers can be as obnoxious as a board member when it comes to managing the company. Board rights we talked about. Uh, you'll give the VC a right to designate one. Protective provisions. Uh, almost always companies are organized under Delaware law. Why is it? That's so we can waive class voting. What's class voting? That's the idea on major decisions like a sale of the company. In many states, such as California, every class has a right to vote and there's nothing you can do about that, no matter how much you agree otherwise. In Delaware, you don't have that rule. You can just agree that everybody votes as one class. That way the founders can't hold up a sale if a majority of all the shares want to do it. It's a huge deal. It's what drives everybody to Delaware. That and a lot of other things, but that's probably the biggest one. Um, 
When you get into later rounds, you're going to see later sets of protective provisions. This is probably advanced venture capital, but you have to do a little game theory here and make sure you don't give later investors, you know, um, uh, an ability to, to, uh, to hold up a deal because their interests are going to be different than earlier investors for reasons we're not going to get into today. Other protective provisions, here's some standard provisions. They get to block certain actions. Of course, the VC gets to veto any sale of the company. Uh, the, VT, the VC is going to have to approve any later financing that comes ahead of theirs to increase the number of shares, to redeem shares, to take money out of the company. Then there's some optional ones. You can't pay bonuses to your brother-in-law, stuff like that. Um, that's a good list. Information rights. Um, every VC is going to want financial statements. Most venture funds are audited. They're going to, if you're a big enough round, they're going to want audited statements. Uh, just be prepared for that. Be prepared to have a lot of transparency. Be prepared to get off QuickBooks and start doing it right with a professional. Uh, the important thing is, is that it's real hassle to have to give all these reports and notices out to everybody, not just information rights, but other rights that they have. So we only give those to major investors uh, and that's investors who exceed a certain threshold. Okay, this should be the briefest slide that I have. Registration rights. Um, don't ever negotiate over registration rights in 30 years. I've never seen anybody exercise a registration right, even though we fight over where the commas should go in the documents pretty regularly and charge you for it. Uh, don't, don't fall for that. What a registration right is, it's, a re it's where the investor can require the company to go public. Okay, we can just demand that you go public. Or if you do do a public offering, you have to take our shares along so we get liquidity. Um, it, for a lot of reasons, it's just not practical. And I'm not saying it never happens. I'm just saying I've never seen it. So I don't fight too much over just standard garden variety registration rights. If the venture capitalist wants it, usually I try to get them to not want it and say, how about we just promise to give you the same reg rights we give to the next guy? And the reasonable ones will take that and the rest of us won't. <clears throat> Okay, this is a slide I skipped. Uh, transfer restrictions. Um, yes, I know this is standard. This is common. You see it in every deal. Why is this a big deal? Why are you making me listen to this? Um, you got to pay attention to this because this can make a big difference. Um, I've, I've been in many deals. Right now, there's a lively secondary market because it's so hard to go public and private companies are getting so big so fast. Um, but they can't sell their shares in a secondary. You know what a secondary is? It's for you, Mr. Founder, or somebody who's got common stock. You want to go sell your shares to, you know, some secondary fund or your brother-in-law or whoever. Um, well, you might not be able to because the company is going to have a right of first refusal. That keeps you from selling it. How does that work? Well, the company has a right to buy them at the offered price to somebody else. That really chills any third party from wanting to buy them. Not only does the company have a right, but the investors have a right too. You got to offer it to both of them. And they all have to decline it before you can sell it. I've been through this many times. If your stock's worth anything, the investors are going to pick it up. All right. So that's going to chill third party offers. Now, there are a million ways around that. A lot of people are using what they call forward contracts to get around it. Uh, I've done those deals myself. Uh, I caution you, that's trickier than you might think. We've got this thing called the Dodd-Frank Act that applies, uh, arguably, depending on who you talk to, I think it does. Uh, but there's a regulatory overlay. Uh, it's not quite so easy. A forward contract is where you say, look, I know you can't sell your shares to me because they're subject to a right of first refusal. I'll tell you what, I'll give you $100 today and you give me 10% of the proceeds of the sale of those shares down the road, or you give me 10% of the shares when you can sell them. That's a forward contract. Uh, be careful about those deals. They can be done, but they have to be carefully reviewed. A uh, co-seller right says, gee, you're going to sell your shares to the investor. You know what? I don't want to buy them because that guy's a fool. He's paying too much for your stock. In fact, he's such a fool. I want him to buy my shares, the investor shares at the same time. That's a co-sale right or tag along right. Drag along is just the opposite. The investor found a seller for his shares, but the buyer says, I don't want just your shares, Mr. Investor. I want everybody's shares. I'm a greedy SOB. Well, good news. I got a drag along right. I can force the founders to sell their shares to you along with mine. Um, make sure, and you're going to see that every deal. You're going to see that in every deal. In all of this stuff, there should be carve outs, right? So you can you know, negotiate a carve out, co-sale right, you know, negotiate a carve out, write a first refusal, give yourself a little room to take a little bit of money off the table. Here's a scenario, you're the founder, you built this thing up, you brought the big bad VCs in, things didn't work out, um, you went your separate ways, you kept your vested shares, now you wanna get some liquidity, 
um, but you know you can't. But you can if you get a carve out. You can sell a few shares. I'm giving away all these secrets. I don't know if there's any VC ever going to talk to me again after this. Founder vesting. I think we've already talked quite a bit about this. I'll just pause and say that um, the VCs are going to make you revest or unvest and start that clock ticking all over again. Just you know, just expect it. Um, in other words, if you had four year vesting and you're three years into it and then you do your financing, you'll probably start your four years again. Uh, just expect it, don't be offended. Think of it from their standpoint, they need you to stick around long enough to sell the company. You might ask for acceleration. It would be fair to say, well, okay, Mr. VC, I'm willing to do that, but me, the founder, um, if, if we do have a sale of the company before my vesting period expires and I'm redundant and I get fired because of it, uh, I think I should get full vesting. So I get the, you know, all of my cashed out of all of my shares, not just part of them. And then I just want you to be aware of the game we play in Silicon Valley called Fire the Founder. It's a rare founder that has the skills needed to start a company and take it from zero to one and to stick with that company and take it to where the VC wants to go. Founders get fired all the time. Uh, just expect that to happen, prepare for it, get your spreadsheets out, understand where you're gonna be, who your friends are, and. Uh, you know, and what you think might happen. We waited too long to talk about pro rata rights. I should have talked about them when we were talking about SACE, but good things come to those who wait. Thanks for sticking around. Pro rata rights. That is a right that even the safe investors would have asked for. And that is a right to maintain their percentage interest, a right to participate in later financings. It is so important. Think of it from the investor standpoint. They get into a deal and they took a big risk. They bet on you early, right? <clears throat> They want to know that if your company takes off, they're going to have a right to get into the next round. All right. That's really important to them because that's going to be very valuable just to be led into that round because they see you're on that upward trajectory. Okay. That's a pro rata right or a right to maintain. Um, it's very important. They're always going to ask for it. Um, it's something that you need to be aware of because the more pro rata rights or right to maintain you give, um, you only want to give that to major investors. Uh, because you're going to limit the amount of new investors that you can bring into the deal. So something to think about, something to model, but something that you are going to be giving up. Option plan. Remember, we talked a lot about what an option plan is and what options are. Okay, so here's another thing that's going to happen when you go talk to the VCs. So don't be offended. This is just back in the good old days. I used to be able to slip this one by them, but now I can't. Uh, when I'm on the company side is let's increase that option plan right after we close. So you take part of the dilution for it. Never works that way now. The VC is going to say, look, we're going to close, but on close, you're going to set it, you're going to reserve a big pool of options that's going to equal 20% post-close. And that 20% is coming out of you, the founder shares, not out of the venture capitalist shares. So expect that's what we call a pre-money increase. Uh, the 409A valuation will change. So, um, you know, people uh, had better, um, you know, get their stock options granted before you close that venture funding. That's going to affect your valuation. By the way, not only that, you might want to exercise before that. Why is that? Well, if you have an NSO, your spread, the amount of tax you pay on exercise is based on the value minus the exercise price. Do that before you have a big nasty valuation that says it's worth Y, y instead of X. But here's a better reason. Qualified small business stock. Remember what I said about that two weeks ago? In order for you to have qualified small business stock, you can buy it on exercise of an option, but the company can't be worth more than $50 million when you buy it. Well, maybe you're worth $49 million today, but after you close that venture financing, you're worth $59 million, right? Better exercise today, you know, if you have the opportunity. Don't wait until after the financing. Uh, even if it's an ISO and you don't pay tax, except for alt men. Uh, on the exercise, you know, get in, keep an eye on that because that QSBS benefit, that's where you exclude 10 times your basis or $10 million from federal tax on sale. If you hold it for five years, it's a big benefit. Um, and this is how, and, and by the way, this might be the number one way that I see people lose that benefit. They don't watch the valuation. Okay, a few other features of preferred stock, um, redemption rights. Um, I think companies have got smart enough now that they don't grant this very often anymore, but it is uh, regularly requested. 
uh, at least in the later rounds. And a redemption right is the idea that the investor can say, hey, look, um, you know, I'm in it for the long term, but my definition of long might not be the same as yours. My fund's going to, you know, close down in four years. So I want you, if you don't have an exit by then, I want you to buy my stock back. So they have a right to put their stock back to the company, their preferred stock. Um, I push back real hard on this because in effect, what it is, it's a right to force a sale of the company. Because if your company's doing well, the investor's not gonna exercise the redemption right. If your company's not doing well, it's not gonna have the money to pay the investor. In effect, what you've done is you've given them a right to force you to go out and sell the company to pay the redemption right. So be sensitive to that, push back on it. All right, we're coming up to the end of the hour. I'm only gonna mention two more things here, anti-dilution. This is mind-bogglingly complicated. I won't go through it other than to say that there are protections in case you do a down round so that the investor doesn't get completely beat up. As a company, you want broad-based weighted average, not full ratchet. Um, that's how these deals are typically done. It means there's not that much of an adjustment. The adjustment is really based taking into account all of the convertibles and options. So it's not a one-for-one -one adjustment. If we had an hour, I could go through the math with you, but I probably wouldn't understand it either. I just know there's a formula and that's the ID behind it. Exclusivity, expect to sign a no shop for 30 to 60 days. If I, that means you can't shop your deal to anybody else once you sign with the VC. Uh, that's important. It keeps you out of the market. Don't go beyond that. I see 90 days sometimes. I see sometimes people try to get six months. Forget it. You go six months without money. Talk about giving up your leverage. And then finally, I'll end with this. Um, uh, your term sheet is going to be non-binding, except for the no shop, except for confidentiality. Um, make sure it really is non-binding because here in California, you know, we impose a duty of good faith and fair dealing on everybody. So you don't want to sign a term sheet uh, just for the heck of it. You have no idea, no, no intention of closing because you can get sued for that. So you want to make sure you have an intention to try to get to a closing. Alrighty, I have got uh, about 10 slides left. I am not gonna get through them tonight. Maybe we'll save that for, for venture capital number three, or you can read about them um, in my, um, uh, in my uh, slides that we send to you. And instead, I'm gonna go to the last one. That's me, darn it, that's me. Uh, Haynes and Boone, I've posted my contact information along with LinkedIn pages and groups you should join uh, in chat. If you didn't get it, chat me and I'll send it again. Uh, but feel free to look me up. We'll be sending these materials out. And now I'm going to open it up to questions. But first, I'm going to stop the share. All righty, I've stopped the share. And we do have a few questions here. Question, ah, my favorite, my number one fan is here, uh, anonymous attendee. Anonymous shows up at every one of our events and he has a question, always awesome questions too. Says how to decide, how to divide the, divide the, you misspelled divide anonymous, but how do you divide the equity for each founder equally? Um, so we did a whole thing on this. Um, we did a whole thing on this uh, two weeks ago, on how to divide equity in companies. And really, there's just a handful of ways. The most common way is, is equal. Uh, you have three founders, you split it equally. Um, I don't like that myself, uh, because not all people are, not all founders are created equal. That is most common. We also talk some uh, about some other ways. Another way is through negotiation. Uh, but that favors the person who's the best negotiator, right? Maybe you've come to my negotiation classes, so you're just going to tear up your co-founders. A uh, third way is to do it through a formula, a subjective formula. That's a little better. At least you've got some, you've got or an objective formula. You've got some criteria. And finally, there's a dynamic split model that we talked quite a bit about last week. And that's where you measure everybody's contribution uh, as you go along. And you adjust periodically based on that contribution. So if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A box. So if you are going to do the equal split, make sure you have plenty of mechanisms to adjust. Vesting, so you can, you, know, you can remove vesting shares. A big option pool, so you can reward the superstars with additional equity. Keep in mind that that decision to divide up equity at the front end, of course, it's important for the first few years, but your starting team, the contributions they have on day one are not gonna be the same contributions they have on exit. 
we should know that. So there should be a mechanism for adjusting. Dynamic split does that really well, uh, but it's a lot of work. So oftentimes we have to compromise and find something else. My personal favorite method is a method that I call the Royce method. That's where we sit down and we subjectively figure out what we think makes the most sense. And then we put in place all sorts of protections, protections to adjust those numbers if people perform above or beyond uh, expectations. Okay, next question. Uh, how much of this presentation holds for EU-based startups and investors? I think quite a lot. I mean, um, uh, well, you're not going to like this, but I think California is where things start, good or bad. Um, a lot of ideas start here. And a lot of what we do here, and I've seen this throughout my career in, in investing, um, you know, there's probably a quarter to half of the, the VC capital in the world, or, or not in the world, in the country is sitting here in Menlo Park, Palo Alto area. So as you can imagine, this is where trends start. And if they catch on, uh, they'll start here and they'll spread. Um, European companies, granted, tend to be a little bit different, right? There are some differences, no doubt about it. I've done enough European deals to know that uh, they have a different view as to how to allocate risk among investor and company, but the general concepts still hold. Startups are the same all over the world in that sense. You got service partners, you got money partners, you got sweat equity, you've got ways to incentivize people. So um, you might, we might, um, we might have some differences, you know, between the 10 yard lines, uh, I guess between the 40 yard lines, but um, the general concepts are going to be very much the same. Uh, so I think a lot of this presentation, almost all of it, because I've kept this at a very high level, uh, applies. Uh, is a safe normally used for early stage funding pre-valuation if it is used for as post-valuation, then what valuation process might be required and how does that affect the holders of the preferred shares? Or right, hold on, back up. You're misunderstanding me. So when we say um, a pre-money safe, um, they, well, first of all, yes, they are used pre-valuation. If you mean a valuation is an investment by a venture capitalist that sets a value for the company, then yes, they are pre-valuation. That's why you do save. So you don't have to value the company. You wait and you piggyback on a later valuation by an institution. All right, so that's how you determine that. Now, can there be a post-valuation safe? Absolutely, absolutely. I have a client that believe it or not, they did a $10 million safe after their Series E round. It converted into Series B, but it converted uh, you know, at the Series B price. They did that instead of a bridge note, which is what we would have done, just a convertible note. Um, uh, and that's pretty pretty late stage, right? You know, 10 million bucks on a safe after, a, God, I think we raised $50 million in their A. So, you know, big money, uh, but yeah, we can use it. And it's gonna have the same sorts of terms. How's it going to affect the holders? Well, it's just going to be more money that comes into the next round of funding. That's how it affects them. So everybody gets diluted. Is it possible to convert one type of stock to another? If and when the role of the stockholder changes, say a service provider becomes a partner. Okay, so preferred commonly converts to common. Yeah, that's built right into the terms. Remember what I told you about the uh, participation and the liquidation preference and how you might want to convert your preferred into common instead of just taking your liquidation preference? Okay, that's one way, preferred to common. Or all the preferred holders might get together and by majority, uh, they'll say, uh, look, we need, to, you know, we need to do a recap and make everybody common for a lot of reasons. So yes, the answer is preferred converts to common all the time. Does common ever convert to preferred? There's only one instance that I can tell you about where I know that regularly happens. And that's, we talked about this at the tail end of last time. And that's where you have founders preferred, or I guess series, is it double F or F? I get them confused, but it's F stock. Um, and the idea is, is that the founder uh, gets this common stock that will convert to preferred when you do a preferred stock financing. Okay, why do we do that? So that the founder can sell some of that founder's preferred stock that converted on financing to the preferred stockholder at its current fair market value. So let me back up a little bit um, and make, put your questions into the Q&A box if you have questions, by the way. Let me back up, because this is very common. I want you to get this. So um, 
Founders take money off the table all the time. Your investor comes along, you've been living on top ramen for the last 10 years. Uh, you're gonna, they're gonna put a bunch of money into the company. Well, and you know what? I'm a founder, I should get some cash out of this. I haven't taken a salary forever. Okay, how can we do that? You can pay yourself a bonus and get taxed at Joe Biden's 39.6%, right? Or you can sell some of your stock and hopefully get capital gains. So that works if you sell your stock for what it's worth. Remember what I said, preferred stock's worth this, common's worth that. You don't wanna sell your common for this. We all know it's gonna be worth this. You wanna sell it for this price. Any investor wants to buy it for that. Well, if you do that, this spread, this difference, that's a bonus to you. That's ordinary income because the company just did you one heck of a favor, right? So uh, if that's if the company redeems it. So some mechanisms to get around that is sometimes we have the investor buy that stock. I've got a whole article on the risks around that. It's commonly done. Another way that somebody came up with is let's make the founders common convertible into preferred. Preferred stock investor comes along. They put money into the company and they buy some preferred. They give some money to founder and he sells some of his preferred to the investor and he sells it, he gets capital gain because he's selling it for what it's worth, right? Not for some price above what it's worth. I don't think it works. I'll just tell you, I don't think it works. If you have an hour and will buy me a beer, I'll tell you why, but as a tax lawyer, I don't like it. So I discourage it, but that's the only other scenario that I've seen that happen. Would NDAs with IP disclaimers included in them serve as invention assignments in the case of a dispute? I need to see the language. I don't know what you mean by IP disclaimer, but there is a case here in California. It's a very important case that says that what you need is I hereby assign or something like that, okay? Something like that. Not I promise to assign in future, you know, not, uh, you know, anything that says I'm going to do this in the future, it's I hereby assign. Um, in a way, this is where IP law is a little like real estate law, isn't it? It feels like a deed. So I need to see the language. The answer is maybe, maybe. Uh, another question from anonymous attendee. Thanks, Roger. This is very enlightening. Thank you. That's a very fair question. Okay, next question. What is the best approach? Negotiate with multiple VCs at the same time or go to them one by one? Um, you want to negotiate with multiple VCs at the same time, but you don't want them to know who each other are. And they are going to ask you. They're going to say, who else are you talking to? You are not going to tell them. If you don't remember anything else I've told you here tonight, because I'll tell you what, as soon as you tell them, they're going to hang up the phone and call up that VC and they're going to gang up on you. Um, so you want multiple VCs, but you don't want them knowing it. Now, that does, sometimes syndicates come along where you have a lead and they all do know, do know who they are. That's a different scenario. What you want to do is solicit a bunch of term sheets uh, about the same time so you can pick the best one. We compare them. Remember I said about valuation versus preferences? We didn't talk about this, but you need to do some math when you get term sheets and figure out what gets you the best deal at different numbers. Is it participating? Is there a big preference? You know, is it not participating, but a lower valuation? What's going to get me the best deal? You need a spreadsheet to figure that out. And if you get multiple term sheets, you're in a good position. You can figure out who's, who's best. Uh, you can't go to them one by one because you go to one, they're going to give you a term sheet and they're going to say, sign it. Once you sign it, there's going to be a no shop in it. And a no shop means you cannot go talk to anybody else for another 30, 60 days until you're done negotiating with them. So uh, it's not really an option, but thanks for the question. Uh, is it ve better to pitch and present fair value or pro proposed price equity of the VCs of pie based on the founder's perspective? Um, I, I, I honestly don't know what you mean by that question, uh, but that's never stopped me from answering a question before. So let me take a shot at it. Uh, I don't think you want to present your company as having a valuation. I think you want to let the VC to tell you what they think you're worth by making an offer. That's negotiation 101 when it comes to VCs, uh, right? You let them make the first offer. Whatever number you give them, they're going to cut it in half. Now, sometimes you can have lots of support behind it with a bunch of spreadsheets and, and other, um, you know, and other interests. But um, I, I don't think uh, you do any of those. You let the VC give you a number. Harrison Rose has a question. Hi, Harrison. Thanks for joining us here tonight. I better read the question before I say, you know, okay, I'm going to come back to that question. Uh, seed funding needs valuations or can be done as safes. 
Um, seed funding um, can be done as safe. So you don't need valuation. That's why you do seed funding. Who's the best startup accelerator besides Y Combinator? You know, I had an accelerator. I think mine is the best. My companies did awesome. It was an ag tech accelerator, had an incubator, in fact, had 15 companies for six months. I uh, gave them space. I gave them tender, loving care and feeding, and I introduced them to investors. They did pretty well. I'm never going to do that again. Um, there's some really good accelerators out there, but you know, do your diligence, talk to companies that have been through them, find out what they're offering you. There are some big name accelerators. I don't think they offer that much. There are some other accelerators that just offer, you know, awesome, awesome, awesome services. The best accelerators are the ones that invite me to come speak to their people and give them presentations like this. I do that frequently all over the country, all over the world now with Zoom. So those are the best accelerators. Suppose you have a company that can't pay minimum wage and wants to just give equity uh, to their uh, employees. You can get away with that with founders, um, but you cannot get away with that with uh, any of your rank and file, your engineers, your software people, et cetera. That's a violation of California's minimum wage law. And you're subjecting your company to minimum wage claims by that employee. Not only that, we've got this thing called the Private Attorney General's Act, which means that any such employee can sue on behalf of all the other employees, whether they want to be part of that lawsuit or not. So uh, that is a, a big problem. It's a big problem. I call that, you know, a, a fire that you, that's the, 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 what was that? The Forest Hall fire. Uh, it's, a Santa, it's a Sonoma County fire, uh, as opposed to fires you can let burn uh, that, you, that you don't have to put out. Um, if you have multiple ideas across multiple industries, how to strategize your pitch? How many ideas per VC is ideal? How do we know the industry fit or area of interest for this? Well, that's a lot of questions. Okay. You better pick one and run with it. You better pick a horse, you know, and uh, yeah, a lot of horse metaphors tonight, but you better pick one horse and, 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 and bet on it. Uh, if you have too many ideas, you're going to come across as being... Um, as being unfocused. And there's nothing an investor hates more than an unfocused founder. They want you laser focused on, on what you're doing. Uh, and then you're going to hear this expression if you haven't already, oh, you're trying to boil the ocean. You're boiling the ocean. You're trying to do too much at one time. Just pick one vertical and go with it. Or pick one, one phase of the stack and go with it, whatever it is. Um, that's general advice. Of course, you want to get a business person, not me. I'm just a lawyer to take a harder look at your business and give you their, their views. Um, so I think pitching a bunch of ideas to a VC is not a great idea. I don't think it's ideal. Uh, I think it comes across as unfocused and, I, and they're not in the business to sit in around listening to ideas that aren't gonna make them any money. So I would not go that approach. How do you know if, if you're given pitching, how do you know you're not selling snow to an Eskimo? Are you talking about, are you talking the right idea to the right VC? Do your homework, man, do your research. Nothing more important than that. And VCs are not hiding. You can go on their website. You can find out all about them. You know what they like, what they invest in, who their successes have been, which of your competitors they're invested in. You know, that's just as important. You don't want to go give your ideas to somebody that can't invest in you because they're all in on your competitor, but know who you're talking to. When you get a term sheet, how much time would you get before you have to sign it before the offer expires? About five days. They give you a very short period of time very short window. That's why it's kind of hard to get multiple term sheets. You have to script that really carefully. Yeah, they don't want you sitting on their offers very long. By the way, the best VCs, um, you get a term sheet, you can take that to the bank, they're going to close. Um, the, the smaller VCs, sometimes they might not have that track record. You might want to get to know that uh, before you get too far, before you sign that term sheet, if you have competing term sheets. We talked about that two weeks ago. Whoa, how do you value the salaries of founders who start working in the company? Or some go, I mean, some go without salary. Well, so here's the thing. We did a whole presentation here. We do it regularly. It's called How to Split the Pie. Uh, uh, how to divide equity, reward contributors, make your lawyer happy, something like that. How to do a lot of things. But it was mostly around how do you divide up the equity in a company? And uh, as I said earlier, there's several methods, uh, one of which is the... Um, one of which is to um, divide it equally and then have a mechanism for adjusting when a company gets a little more mature, more mature like vesting. Uh, 
uh, and a big option pool. Uh, another which is to use a subjective formula. Uh, another approach is to use an objective formula. Another approach is to use dynamic split. So uh, just keep those in mind. I think I've probably already answered that question. So I'm gonna, by the way, uh, almost all founders go without salary. Uh, if you say some are going without salary, that means somebody's getting paid. You must have revenue someplace, um, which is kind of unusual in my world. They go without salary, salary until they get funded is usually how it goes. I'm gonna pause on that because I, I do recall sitting in on a meeting where I'm not making this up either. I wish I were. Such a promising company had a great technology and energy technology, clean tech, and I had stock in it, which is even worse. And we sat down with the investor and the CEO came out and um, rather than, and there's a second meeting, so we thought we were gonna get the money. So he thought that was a good time to bring out a big slideshow on why he as CEO should get $300,000 a year of salary. And he went on and on about why he should get that big a salary. He had statistics and he had models and look what these public company CEOs get. Yeah, that was the last meeting we had with that VC. Um, salary is you, you know, that's something you're going to negotiate, no doubt about it. Uh, that is gonna come up. And I'm glad you mentioned that. We didn't talk about this. That is something that's gonna come up because once the company gets funded, it can pay salaries but you're not gonna get market salaries. You're just not. People are still expecting you to work uh, for equity, depending on what you call market. Let me put it this way. You're not gonna get the same as your, um, your, um, your comparable uh, at Google, right? You're gonna make less because you've got all this equity. That's, that's kind of the way this game works. So don't bring out the slides and the studies that show that Fortune 500 CEOs all make a half million dollars a year or whatever it is. All righty, um, at exit, will the preferred shareholder get more than their shares in common? Um, so I have preferred, and they say at exit, I'm gonna get um, three times what the common gets. Yeah, so it depends on the term. Well, yes, it's always gonna get more than common. That I can promise you. That's what the preference is. The preferred gets paid first. Um, or it'll get uh, its pro rata share. So, so let me put it this way. It'll either get more than common, basically sold for less than the preferences, uh, or it'll get the same per share as a common because it converted to common and took its share. Now, if you have participating preferred, that always gets more than the common. Non-participating will either get more if it takes the preference, or it'll get the same as the common uh, if it converts uh, into common, which you would expect to do. Alrighty, so we have a couple more here I want to get. So here we have a company incorporated in another country. Um, should we incorporate in Delaware? And then a Delaware company will acquire the shares of our foreign company and raise capital in the United States. Should we do that? What will be the fiscal impact of that? Uh, is that a good idea? Help me, Roger. Uh, yes, um, that is what we call a flip transaction. So we didn't get to this. Uh, yeah, we did. I did mention this. Um, VCs in the United States, um, they want to invest in Delaware corporations. That's what they invest in. So uh, if you're a foreign company, you're not a Delaware corporation. So what are you going to do? What we do is we form a Delaware company. The shareholders of the foreign company, they drop their shares of the foreign company into the Delaware corporation in exchange for shares of the Delaware corporation. Now the foreign shareholders own all the shares of the Delaware company, which owns all the shares of the foreign company, which hopefully owns all the intellectual property, the business, the people, the properties, et cetera. So the VC will invest in this Topco, this Delaware company. And in that manner, they get a piece of everything, the whole company, and they got the protections of Delaware law. That is a flip transaction. We do that all the time. It's super simple as a US matter, not a problem as a US matter. However, can be a problem as a foreign matter because uh, a lot of countries will tax the foreign founders on that transaction. They don't like to see their stock leaving the country. The U.S. is the same way. We've got, you know, we got other rules around that, but the foreign country is going to tax you oftentimes. Not every country, but a lot of countries. Um, Canada comes to mind. So, because it's so, because you would think they'd be a lot friendlier to us because they're, they're our neighbor. Uh, but so a lot of countries will, will, will tax that. Uh, if that happens, 
we either have to, and, and the other thing is you might've taken money from a foreign agency as a foreign country and they don't want you to do that transaction, or you might not get the shareholders to agree to that transaction. Those are all foreign company, foreign country issues. So US matter works perfectly. It works so perfectly, we just don't do it that often because it's, it, it, you know, without taking the hit on the tax side. So what can you do? I have some workarounds, okay? Um, you know, first, maybe we just get low valuations and we just take the pain. Uh, secondly, maybe we do an asset deal that is not subject to tax in the foreign country. I've done this in the Netherlands. Um, thirdly, and I've done this with Canada, maybe we do parallel entities. Uh, so you have a Delaware company and a foreign company side by side, and you have investments that are mirrored. Now that ends up, may end up resulting in the foreign company being taxed in the U.S., uh, there's some complicated tax rules around that called stapled stock, but there are ways to deal with this. All right. Um, how do you arrive at optimal valuation? A too high valuation would not interest the VCs and a low valuation with the startup at a risk of underfunding. Well, like I said, it's not your job to arrive at the valuation. That's what the VCs go to do. Here's one way that they might do it. And I'm not being facetious. I see this often and I've heard it expressed this way. Let's see, um, you need $2 million to get to your next valuation metric, your next, your next inflection point. Um, I need 20% of your company, Poof, that's your valuation, all right? That's, it's oftentimes that unscientific. Uh, however they do it, um, it's going to be <clears throat> the venture capitalist that makes an offer to you. If they, make an, if they expect you to give them a number, that happens sometimes, Go through my you know, 30 ways, find three of them that converge in a spreadsheet of the 30 different methods I've given you um, and uh, go ahead and, and present that. Okay, what do you think about the prospects of a startup that addresses the inaccessibility of low barrier STEAM educational kits? Well, I'm here to talk about the legal aspects. I will tell you one thing, education technology is hot right now. A lot of things are hot now that you never would have thought of been. And that's one of them, um, educational technologies. Um, and not just not, and not just school age education, but all kinds of educational technologies, given that you know, all we're doing is sitting around bettering ourselves, learning, uh, learning things about it. You know what else is hot? Pets, <laughs> companies that do something for pets. Everybody's gotten so close to their pets these days. Pet tech has gotten to be a, a big thing. Ken, um, you discussed creating a Chinese subsidiary. Um, yes, uh, I can. <clears throat> In fact, we have a Shanghai office and we have lawyers over there. We do a lot of work cross-border with Asia. And, <clears throat> and I've done a lot of these Chinese subsidiary deals. Uh, it's what they call a WUFI, uh, a wholly owned foreign enterprise. It's subject to Chinese regulation. And then there's something close to this that you might have heard a lot about. A lot of times when we do a financing in China, we'll use what is called a VIE structure. Uh, and, it's at it, and that's if uh, it's a regulated industry and the China, we need to get into that market and get Chinese investors. But Chinese law doesn't allow an investment. So we form an organization, enter into a license and service agreement. So that basically sucks the profits out of the Chinese company into the VIE company uh, as a management fee and the investor invests in, in, in the foreign company. Uh, that's one way we see doing it a lot. Sometimes we'll form, a lot of times we'll form a subsidiary just to go get into the Chinese market. So we'll have a subsidiary with minority shareholders, which you normally hate doing. Sometimes that's what you have to do to get into the Chinese market. So there's a lot of ways to, to skin that cat, but you know, um, it kind of depends. Depends on what your investors want, what you want, what the market wants. Uh, somebody says they're asking me a dumb question. There's no dumb questions, okay? Um, oh, except that one. That's a really dumb question. No, I'm kidding. Um, let me ask, if the VCs invest in my project, will I be able to retain my patent post-funding? No, the answer is no, you will not. And I know exactly what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, no, okay, I'm gonna tell you a story. Um, the traditional answer is no. VCs want that company to own its IP, to own it. They want an assignment of the patent. You're thinking, well, wait a minute. My patent has animal applications. It has plant applications. Uh, or my patent has uh, health applications and uh, other, I had another company. 
My patent, uh, it's a device, a medical device it can use for, for, for organ surgery, it can use for heart surgery, it can use for different applications. Um, here's what I have done successfully. Boy, you guys are getting some good tips. You're getting your money's worth tonight because uh, no one else is gonna tell you this, but I have done this successfully. And I mean, wildly successfully. Suppose you drop that patent that has all these applications under the company, VC funds it, you go in a direction. Remember what I said, they want you to focus. The thing falls on its butt. Now you've got a patent in a failed company. You got to sell the patent. The VC makes you. You get, you know, you get peanuts out of it. You pay the VC their preference. Everybody goes home. You just got screwed. What I have done in that scenario is I set up a patent holding company. I assign the rights to a vertical to the company and say we're going to finance this vertical. And if this vertical fails, we're not out of business because we're going to put the rights to some other vertical in a different company. And if the VC pushes back and says, I hate that idea, I want all rights to the patent sale, I'll tell you what, Mr. VC, how about you invest in both of these? How about we give you a piece of the patent holding company? How about we give you a piece of the other company? I did have one occasion when the VC forgot to ask. Um, I think they just forgot to notice, right? So when the company failed, the VC came along, sent us a demand letter, said, we're going to sell the patent, you know, get ready. And I had to inform him, sorry, pal, you don't own the patent, you know, have a nice life. Um, I don't like to you know, be in those kinds of discussions, but the strategy worked great. So um, I'm glad you asked that question. I haven't talked about that in years. It's a well-kept trade secret. You guys, through your intense cross-examination, managed to drag it out of me. On that sad note, I think I'm just going to go home. So I want to thank you all for being a good audience here tonight. I want to thank you for your questions. I want to remind you that we do this frequently. Again, uh, there will be an email coming around with the slides, with the video and the recording. You can find all of this, plus about 100 of my other talks on various topics uh, on my YouTube channel, um, Roger Royce Law YouTube channel. I sent you a link. I hope I did. Uh, if not, email me and I will. And I also sent you a link to our LinkedIn startup group. Please join my group. And with that, I want to thank you. See you next time.